This is Dave Arnold, your host of Cooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan and Rockefeller Center, New York City, joined in the studio with, holy crap, I just got dizzy. For the first time <laughs> in a long time doing this, I like, I clenched my body so tight that like the blood went out of my head for a minute and I almost just doop, passed out. <laughs> anyway, joined as usual with John sitting here in front of me. How you doing? Doing great. Got Joe Hazen running the panels over here. How you doing? I'm doing very well, man. Good to see you guys. Yeah, good to see you. This is a No Tangent Tuesday, by the way. Yes, sir. That means only tangents. Only tangents. Uh, in the... I don't know. Okay, so I know that there was, like, over the weekend, possibility of molecules in Connecticut with uh, Nastasia, but I didn't hear any explosions coming from the direction of Stanford, so I don't know. <laughs> Dude, was, where, where are you now, Jack? I'm still in D.C., but I was indeed uh, at Nastasia's yeah. over the weekend. Yeah. How, you had good weather. Yeah, it was for, fantastic. For normal people. We, I, we had I, Peter Kim there. It was great. Oh, nice, nice. I hated it, the weather. I was in New Haven, and I forgot to bring my hat. So every time I walked outside, I was like, <sighs> like vampire action went off. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hate that good mm-hmm. weather. There's nothing worse than good weather right at the, right at the water, too. There's no protection. You know what I mean? But everyone else thinks the exact wow, opposite. That's a hot so, take. Yeah, well, very not, hot take. Dave. I'm not saying that you should hate it. I'm just saying this is what the, my worst thing is. See, I think most hot takes right. they try to tell other people what's good or bad. I'm just saying what's bad for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And how well, much it was a take about being hot? Technically, so it was. It's not even just heat. Like it doesn't <laughs> have to be hot. It's just you know. Uh, it's like I, it's weird because I like garlic. You know what I mean? And I'm fine with wooden crosses, but the sunlight just right. burns straight into me. Just burns. Like, I just like, even if it's not oh. hot out, it just really just nukes me. It's no good. Uh, how, about you? how about you, Nastasia? How are you doing? And you're in Stanford right now, I assume? No, remember I'm in Portland, Oregon. Oh, oh. with your brother? I don't remember that, but I knew you were going at some point, yeah, but I don't know what day is what day. So yeah. I don't know where I am day to day, Nastasia. How can I remember? How can I remember where you are day to day when I can't remember where I'm going to be from day to day? Because we talked about meeting up with Aaron. Yes, I Aaron. Aaron. Yes, okay. but like the but the point is that I don't remember what day anything happens in my own life. Never expect me to remember what's happening in your life, right? That's fair. Well, I mean, not fair, but so you're very close to where uh, where my man Quinn is in the upper upper left. Yeah, 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 yeah. How far is it from Portland to Vancouver? It's got to be like, but it's got it's still far. It's still got to be like six hour drive or some crap, right? Seven, I think so. something uh, like that. Whole state of Washington, probably. you got to go through, right? Yeah, whole, whole state. I remember my grandpa drove me from Portland, Oregon, to Mount St. Helens. In an extremely underpowered early early eighties Dodge motorhome. Now my grandfather, being uh, cheaper even than I am, right, got the tiniest motor. My th- this motorhome, and this is when I was going up the coast of uh, the west coast of the United States uh, with my grandma, my grandpa, their two dogs, including the one dog that uh, my Stepfather says is the only dog model he's ever seen for uh, for schizoaffective disorder because he just really the reactions this dog had were nuts and the parrot all in this like underpowered motorhome the motorhome had fundamentally a sewing machine motor so we drove from Portland up to Mount St Helens and this was to give you a thing this was the year of the eruption so it was like maybe two three months after the eruption and it was good so I don't remember how long the drive was how far is Mount St Helens from you. Quinn. Probably a long I have no day. idea. Yeah. Nobody Good thing t- about me. I don't go anywhere. Yeah. So you always know where I am. <laughs> That's true. I always know where you are, Quinn. That's good. You're always always gonna be holding down that upper upper left left quadrant, you know? I have, I have to say this also. I've never been on on our continent, I've never been north of you ever. I've been to Vancouver. Does anyone I guess Alaska. Mm. Alaska's north. I've never been. I would like to go. Stasi, maybe someday, if we ever make it, we'll get on a plane and go steal one of Steve Hubachek's giant cabbages. What do you say? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, what do you think would happen? I bet you Steve Hubachek, even though he's just like, you know, kind of a, well, not a regular Alaskan dentist because he grows the world's largest cabbages. So that's not regular, right? He can't just be your bog standard dentist, even in Alaska. 
I bet you there's some alarms on those suckers. I bet you, I bet you even within the giant cabbage community, there is sabotage. And so Steve Hubachek probably has his giant cab. For those of you that don't know, Alaska grows the biggest cabbages anywhere because they have huge long periods of sunlight during the period where the cabbages are growing bigger. And Steve Hubachek, last time we checked, which was like eight years ago, was the the best or the the largest grower of uh, grower of largest cabbages. I bet you those things are protected. What do you think, Stas? I don't know. It doesn't look like it online. I'm looking. It, I, I it doesn't see. No. Is he still? Also, it, the last time he was sixteen. So. So yeah. 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 Wait. So wait. So, so you're saying he's no longer on the internet? As like like someone has surpassed him? There's like a. There's a pretender to the Hubachek throne? I don't know. I can't, can't find anything right now. Listen, if we can find anyone in, uh, in that part of Alaska, I forget the name of the valley, where they, all, the, all the great cabbages in the world are from this valley. If you grow a very large cabbage, we would like to ship it to us. And power saw that thing into the world's largest single cabbage coleslaw. We want to make, let me ask you this. Should we do the world's largest single cabbage coleslaw or the world's largest single cabbage batch of sauerkraut? I'm more no, nervous. I want the cabbage stuffed with the, with the meat. The world, like with a whole cow? That'd be huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So do, a, do a turkey, turkey cabbage roll wrapped in a giant fermented leaf. Well, but a giant turkey. fermented cabbage leaf, you mean. Yeah. yeah. So we would have to somehow – okay, here's the issue. Here's the issue. We need to get salt into the whole thing, right? But we don't want the leaves to break, and I'm assuming they're pretty brittle, right? So we might – and this is not what you should do. So don't get angry at me, people. But we might have to like steam pre-wilt the leaves so that we can get them off. But I've never fermented steamed – par-steamed cabbage before. I don't know whether it's going to be good or bad. I've, I've Why never you seen anyone do it. Water? Well, it's just so how it's huge. No one has a vacuum chamber that big. Yeah, no, I'm saying like a giant syringe, just like mm. plunge a hyper saline solution right into the middle. I mean, what we could do, I mean, uh, barring having a huge, it's not just the middle; it's the individual leaves we need to wilt. We could just submerge the whole thing in an above ground swimming pool of salt water. That will yeah, exactly. desiccate it, yeah. right? Then we can pull the leaves off. Then they would ferment in a reasonable amount of time. Then we can make the giant stuffed cabbages, right? But, mm-hmm. like, this, are we talking, like, do, do we, like, grind up one whole animal and then put it inside of a turkey and then wrap that in a stuffed cabbage? Think of the number of tomatoes we would have to buy to make the tomato sauce to go on that. It would be absurd. Yeah, but you could do just a few, a few leaves of the giant cabbage. You have to make the whole thing. Uh, I think Dave's tall, talking about an all-or-nothing proposition here. Yeah, I mean, like, what do you, what do you want us to do, like, a bunch of different <laughs> things? Yeah, like, I'm just saying, one of the benefits of fermenting the cabbage is it's going to last a while. So you can make, you know, a cabbage roll party of giant stuffed animal cabbages, you know, I think, you know I, one I, night. Originally, the concept was, I mean, like, you know, we have, like, a, a, a single party— you buy a, uh, a new chainsaw that's never been used, and for bar oil, you use salad oil, right? Because you, you, know, you don't want non-food-grade oil in your, in your thing. And then we like, and then like a large crowd eats it. It's not like we're not putting it down for the winter, Quinn. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're, we're trying to consume this sucker as fast as is humanly possible. I also have no idea how, I have no idea how tough the rib of a cabbage that size. Because I, I cut out a portion of the rib when I'm doing the cabbage things, even when they're fermented. You know what I mean? You know how you have to cut out a lot of the rib if, you're, if they're not fermented? Yeah. I cut out some of the rib even when they're fermented. Even then, You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A little bit. A little bit. But like when a cabbage leaf is the size of your yes, whole body. Okay, yeah, that'd be, yeah. You know, yes. it's going to be. Toothsome. That is a good word, toothsome. <laughs> it's going to be toothsome for sure. Uh, yeah, but I mean, Nastasia, can't you see it now? Like a like a like a chainsaw cabbage party at uh, in Stanford. Yes, that would be fun. Yeah, it would be fun. <laughs> uh, so well, you could you what? could ship it here. It'd be a shorter distance. 
Yeah, but then Gwen we wants it for him. Yeah, but then we'd have to ship ourselves there too. The, 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 the six, it's nine oh one, twelve of the other, as they say. Dave. Yep. Dave. I have. Um, yesterday we drove down to the beach in in Portland or in Oregon, and uh, we stopped by a jerky shop, and I got a uh, kangaroo jerky, oh. alligator jerky, and elk jerky. Uh, okay. Are you have you already eaten them? Or are you going to eat them live in front of us and give oh. us a comparison? No, I was going to bring it to the studio when I'm back. Oh, okay. All right. We'll do a comparison. I like that. I like that. Uh, yeah. was, was there a particular shtick that this uh, game jerkiest had? Like something like a, a story jerky. behind them? Just jerk. You walk in and, no. you're, and you're like, what do you got? Person's like, jerky. And you're like, like <laughs> what? He's like, name the animal. Jerky. <laughs> you're like, yeah. yeah. Like, what's an animal? What's an animal? That you would eat jerky of that you've never seen? Kangaroo. True. Any animal, and I'm super really. happy that we're going to have that kangaroo jerky. Uh, I'm, it's going to be, it's going to be the worst meats that I've ever eaten are raccoon, terrible. The bear I had, because the bear was old, terrible. Although I hear bear is quite delicious. Uh, when it's, you know, whatever, the Hokkaido bear and, or whatever, the young bear, whatever. Uh, what else did we make that was terrible? So, uh, th- I've had really bad alligator. I've had neutral alligator and I've had ba- bad alligator. I've never had alligator where I'm like, all right. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Mm, yeah. But I'm interested in the we alligator the jerky. What, uh, the lion. Have- I, you, did you hate the lion? I didn't hate the lion. By the way, we did not I kill don't the remember. lion. The lion tastes like overly tough pork. You know, yeah, uh, but the raccoon I remember being and terrible. The beaver tail, Ugh. smell. Wait, what? Beaver tail was good. The beaver tail smell. That was beaver oh, the, tail smell. Oh, uh, the flapper. Yeah, when we were so anytime you're rendering skin to make uh, chicharrones, so like you know, not like classic ones, but like you know, pork rind style, right? So in other words, you cook the skin for a long time. You know, in water, you, you, you gelatinize the skin, you pull it, you scrape the excess fat, you dehydrate it, and then you fry it to get puff, like store-bought pork, pork rind texture. And you can do that with beaver flapper. The smell of pork skins cooking is not good. Uh, the smell of you after you scraped all the fat off the backside of cooked pork skins is unpleasant at best. It's worse, I think, than like that I've been butchering salmon smell. You know that I've been butchering salmon smell that you can't get out of your freaking hands? Yeah. yeah. And like even one salmon and, 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 and Booker freaking butchers salmon pieces on my board all the time and doesn't properly clean it. It drives me freaking nuts. First of all, he pulls out a, a freaking bread knife and cuts <laughs> fillets with a bread knife on my board and then leaves this like smear of fish on my board. It makes me so bent. I get so bent. And then when he does clean it, he does a terrible job. So it still smells like fish. So I have to clean it anyway. But I feel like I am obliged to make him clean it. Because if I don't, then I'm not setting him up for later in life. Anyway. So uh, the smell of the pig skin is nasty when you're, when you're cooking it. And I like pig. And I like, I like how do we say it? It says... Brajol, brajol, with the pig skin like rolled up. But uh, although my family didn't really make it with pig skin, the pig skin and the what about you, Quinn? You brajol family or no? Uh, or, or are you more so. of a brajol Not family? Often. No, but yeah, like nowadays, lately, lately, my dad will make uh, various pig skin uh, ragouts and stews. Mm. Although I don't think we ever did the rolled pig skin. Yeah, we used to do we it with the rolled like slices of. Yeah, Mitch. that's what we did. That's that's what yeah. that's what we did that way. Although I have to say, my trick, my my special trick for uh, when I pressure cook uh, pork shoulder is to remove the skin, pressure cook the pork uh, sh- uh, the skin with the meat, pull it, and then blend this the uh, cooked skin into the sauce, and it's like unctuous city. It's like shebang. You know what I mean? The sauce just gets like that, not over. You know. It's not overly gelatinous, but it gets that, and then that it sets up like hard as a rock, like a ping pong ball. When you make a stock, when it cools, and it doesn't set, aren't you like, oh. Very sad, yeah. It's sad, right? Disappointed, yeah. Yeah. Like, to me, it's like a a mark of success. You know what I mean? You've made it. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Do you know how old I'm getting? I forgot who sang Looks Like We Made It yesterday. 
And Jen was like, Barry Manilow, you idiot. You idiot. Anyway. Um, all right. So uh, this is a No Tangent Tuesday. So before we do any, any culinary stuff from last week that you guys want to get out before uh, you forget it? I mean, we should probably talk about the spin ball again. Okay. What do you want to say? What are we allowed to say? What do you got for me, Quinn? Well, I mean, uh, something I realized about last week's uh, discussion of it, we didn't tell people where to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, this is the worst website name of all time. All right? Oh, I'm ready. <laughs> this is dumb, diddy, dumb, diddy, dumb, 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 dumb. You are <laughs> dot cool <laughs> forward slash spins all. Now, <laughs> it's like... Oh, wow, it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it should be... But you. It's, it's, it's the letter U, the letter R. So yeah, yep, yep. letter U, letter R, dot, cool. <laughs> now, I think I should say that if you have to say that you're cool, <laughs> you are not cool, Right. I mean, I would have been happier if it were you are dot dumb forward splash uh, slash. By the way, they just say I know that everyone just says slash now, but like I'm old, so I will continue to say forward slash or, or uh, as opposed to backslash. Uh, and you can't stop me. And like, I guess that's not true. You could come here and beat me up, but I'm going to say fo- forward slash. Yeah, that's a dumb. So, Stas, when when you heard what that URL was, weren't you like, what would you say? I well, I read it. That that was what it was going to be, and I groaned. Yeah, you're know, like shaking, shaking your head. I could hear, I could hear the waves from you shaking your head. No, nope. no. <laughs> uh, why did you say? Why did you say something, dude? Because it was already set up. You know what am I going to do? Anyway, so uh, we. That's why I was asking about the Barry Manilow thing because it looks like it looks like we're very close to saying looks like we made it, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, and, uh, the stuff- and people can also yeah. go to either your Instagram or the Booker and Dax Instagram or Booker and Dax dot com, and there's also links to in all of those places yeah. to the presale. All right. Well, if we're going to talk spins all for a minute, uh, I'm, we were supposed to put out a bunch of content, but luckily we had a bunch of people who knew about it already, and so that's why you know we're close to making it. By the way, Stas, in the I, two things you're going to hate. First of all, what's your favorite Barry Manilow song? Um, I don't know right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw some out. Copacabana overplayed, correct? Yeah, don't like it. Okay. Mandy. That's pretty good. It's a good song. Gave and gave without taking. I love it. Anyway, uh, so maybe we'll, you know, we'll do a cover version of that uh, for the Patreon. We won't. But that would be amazing. Imagine if we did a Looks Like We Made It or a Mandy cover. If we started doing karaoke for the Patreon, we would lose all of our patrons. Yeah, I don't yeah. do karaoke, so. I don't usually do karaoke. Yeah. In fact, okay, so I was at my 30th reunion. And by the way, the majority of the people there looked awesome. I went to college in New Haven, i.e. <laughs> Yale. And I went to the, uh, the reunion, and they did a karaoke. And if you're my age, which is 52, if you're my age... Uh, there are certain songs you will hear when people play songs for people your age. And everyone has different ones, right? So for us, you can't get out of an event without hearing Groove is in the Heart by Delight. And I love that song. That's great. You can't overplay Bootsy ever, right? That's not possible to overplay Bootsy Collins. That's just nothing to have. But if I never hear Come On Eileen by Dexie and the Midnight Runners, and I had to hear it twice. And it's not that it's a bad song. It's just I'm done. You know what I mean? And someone, they, they had a karaoke thing. I stepped in and they were doing Dexy and the Midnight Runners. And I'm not saying that I hadn't had anything to drink because that would be a lie. But I was told that I was being a little bit aggro with my, <laughs> uh, I think I used the words basic and that, you know, Dexy needs to fall off the face of the earth. I just went ape on them because it just, why would anyone need that? What do you think, Stas? I hate that song. Yeah. What, so w- when you're at these kind of events for people your age, what's the song that you ha- that's going to happen that like, you can't get around happening? It? I don't go to reunions. You know this. I hate that stuff. If you've never been to something with people your age and people are playing songs to pander to you? Ever? No. Wow. Mm. Mm. All right. Anyone else? Anyone else got their, their age going to age themselves with the pander songs? 
I don't keep in touch with people, right? I don't keep in touch with people, so it's my opportunity to say, oh, you're still alive. Isn't that nice? You know what I mean? And I went to, uh, I went to uh, you know, in New Haven, there's a place called Louis Lunch, which is one of the famous new, um, um, Connecticut burgers, right? And the thing about Louis Lunch is, is that they put their burgers on white toast, and the white toast is in a vertical toaster. They put cheese whiz on it and a slice of onion. And then they put their burgers in what amounts to these vertical crematoriums. So it's like these like crematorium doors open and, you know, you see the flame coming out of it. And they put, the, they put it on the gurney and they put it into the crematorium and they shut it and it comes out. And then they slice it. And it used to be that they would kick you out if you asked for ketchup and like threaten you with weapons and stuff. I don't think they do that anymore. They also used to literally only be open for lunch. And now they're open until 1 a.m. But two years in a row, I've tried to go to it, and uh, they've run out of meat. And I was, un- I was oh. unpleased. I was like, hey, how about this? You buy more meat. Yeah. How about that? How about you buy enough freaking meat? I mean, it is a pretty tiny place. Where are they going to store it? I don't care. <laughs> you get, get an extra delivery in the middle of the day. I mean, like, you know. It's true. Money is money. Yeah. And then someone was like, Someone, my friend, was like, well, you, you think you, think, you, know, you deserve it and the people who came earlier don't deserve it? I'm like, no, we all deserve the burger. I would like to hand them money, and in exchange, I would like to have a burger. And it's not like freaking barbecue places. Don't, don't make the comparison with like the Hill Country barbecue places where they should also buy more meat. But on the other hand, it's like there, you know, the cook time is like, you yeah, know, 12 hours or yeah, whatever. Yeah. So it's like. I get it. You know, you, you, you make what you want, and then when it's over, it's over. A burger is like, whap, whap, boom, whap, 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 boom. You can make more. You can make more. It's much more of an a la minute situation. Oh, 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 oh the, the, the toaster's tired. No, suck it. Buy more meat. Anyway, so I didn't get to have uh, my nice. reunion burger. I'm displeased. And then I was talking to this guy, this kid, right? He's, uh, he's you know, he's, he's college age, right? Cause he's, and he's like, I don't like that burger. I'm like, okay. He's like, I'm from Oklahoma, and we season things differently in Oklahoma as though, like, it's the seasoning that matters on that burger. I don't understand it. Anyone from Oklahoma who can hear me, tell me what is an Oklahoma burger that makes it so Oklahoma. Well, I think we're going to have a guest on soon who will be able to discuss that. Yeah. Yeah, every yeah. Every night, my sure. honey lamb and I, we sit alone and no, talk, no. watch a hawk. That's no gawk. No hawk. No making burgers in the sky. Well, he makes burgers, but not in the sky. Oh, that's right. We uh, yeah. he's from he's from Oklahoma. Oh no, no he's, but that's he's, a specialty. Oh yeah, yeah. George Motz is coming yeah. on. When is that? When is that? Uh, June twentieth. There we go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll figure oh, out. Oh, guess that. what else I did in New Haven? Went to Olmo. Uh, oh, Craig Hutchinson right was on there. the show a couple of months ago. Yep. Had some bagels in, in New Haven. Very good. Enjoy it. Go get uh, those high extraction bagels. Yeah. Anyway, so at the reunion, they just got chain bagels. Mm. They got chain mm. bagels. And I'm looking at the bagels and I'm like, I don't want, I don't want chain bagels. And people were eating the chain bagels. I'm like, we could just walk two blocks and get a bagel by someone who's doing something interesting. That's interesting. Good. Yeah. Anyway, I went. Whatever. Okay. Anything else for anyone? Any uh, food-related uh, McGillicuddies before we get into the questions? No? No? Okay. Uh, no. No? Okay. Uh, Alexander Talgard writes in, uh, hey, here again, finally back on Patreon. Oh, by the way, people should join the Patreon. What do you get, uh, What do you get, John, if you join the Patreon? And you can call your questions in to 917-410-1507. That's 917-410-1507. You get access to a whole bunch of cool things like our Discord, uh, access to di- di- bleh, discounts at Kitchen Arts and Letters, uh, prioritized questions getting answered, especially on days like today, No Tangent Tuesdays, um, upcoming discount with Edwards Aged Meats, who sells absolutely fantastic products. Um, yeah, so just cool things. So check well, it out. Uh, the, yeah, go ahead and go for it. The community map. That's right, the community map, too, that everyone hopefully has been uploading to and keeping active. Someone um, had a hard time finding it, so we're going to put on the Patreon, I think, an easier way to find it, right? Or, Quinn, did you talk to that, that patron who had a... Uh, I mean, I gave him a link. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, also, like... And, d- and yeah. oh, well, bonus videos that yeah. I just uploaded the other day. Yeah, so the avoiding uh, the warranty video on uh, how to make uh, a, a less expensive frozen drink machine work with alcohol, that's up, right, Quinn? Yep. Yeah, and pretty. Avoiding the warranty with Dave Arnold. Yeah, yeah. I've been building a four-ton juice press. 
And uh, the build for that's going up on the Patreon. Now, I'm not suggesting that you build a four. You definitely should not build a four ton juice press the way I'm doing it because at this point, I probably should have just bought a used Norwalk. But this is more powerful than a Norwalk. See, for the book, you know, I, I'm. You're doing this in your apartment? Yeah. How does Jen feel about that? What's, uh, <laughs> what's something the opposite of pleased? Well, yeah. I'm trying to like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not the best. I'm using 80-20 extrusions, which are relatively expensive, but I want it to be kind of nice. Four tons for a six-inch square pl- press plate, uh, pressing about two liters of product, it's good. So I'm getting like I'm getting like 50% or so yield of – no, more than 50% yield of juice on ginger. I'm getting – it's like off raw ginger, like higher on apple, like I don't care. And it's good. Like the, the stuff that's left has no taste. I, honestly, I don't believe that cold-pressed juice is any better than regular juice, and there is some data backing me up. But I, I, I don't know enough to say. I originally got the uh, press we had at existing conditions for like squeezing grapes and for like squeezing like all of the liquid out of the waffles after we did the waffle infusion or after we did – Don did a banana bread infusion which did a, or a pumpkin. They're both delicious. Uh, with bourbon, so any, like bourbon with any of those sweet breads is delicious. It's delicious with waffles. It's delicious with pumpkin. It's b- delicious with banana bread. Mm. And when you put it into a press and squeeze it out, you get everything back out of it. Everything. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I've tested so far in the four ton press: ginger juice and carrot juice and carrot apple juice. Yeah. Uh, now. Uh, I'll say this on ginger juice. I'm making a video, and you can go see me clarify ginger juice on the Modernist Pantry thing for the spins all. But Garrett Richard, it, you know, Tropical Standard book just came out. He's going to come on the radio show with Ben later, you know, because the book came out again. This new technique for clarifying starches is ridiculous. I made a mule. I made a, you know, a Moscow mule. Uh, Sky Vodka sent me a bunch of vodka. I did a Moscow mule with it with the spins all. And it, if, it is kind of a life changing mule. I handed it to, uh, I mean, Dax, who's not 21, mm-hmm. took it because he was filming it. He took a sip. He's like, oh, this is delicious. This doesn't even taste like there's alcohol in it. I'm like, well, you shouldn't say that. <laughs> you should say that it still has body and structure, and so you can taste the base spirit. That's what you should say. But the ginger is so pure, so pure. And you can make it without a juicer. I did it with ginger juice that I juiced, and I did it with you know, just a blender. And they both work. Uh, and you'll get the video soon enough, people, especially if you're on the Patreon. Uh, but – no, actually, that one I have to put up because it's for – you get – whatever. It's a good technique. Use magnesium carbonate. Magnesium carbonate, I ordered – did I already say this in the air? I ordered two pounds of it, and the sure. bag it came in, I thought two pounds would be like something reasonable. And the bag that it came in, like there's no place in my house that the bag can fit because it's so fluffy. It's like so freaking fluffy. And so it looks like you're adding a ridiculous amount of magnesium carbonate to your product when you're clarifying it. And, but, like, it all disappears. It just goes away. You know what I mean? You're adding quite, actually quite a bit, 2% anyway, but, like, uh, it all settles out. It's not soluble. So it's not something that ends up in your product. It's literally acting just like, like a blanket that just, like, pushes all of the starch down with it as it goes. And then, you know, you chuck it when you're, when you're done. But it is a great technique. I'll tell you this, which because the video probably won't have time. When you're clarifying with magnesium carbonate, you want to add it, stir it up, and stir it a couple of times. And right before you spin it or do the final settle, make sure that it's looking like it's going clear. Stir it up one more time so that it can capture absolutely everything and go down. You don't need to blend it. You just literally stir it in, and it's good to go. Alexander Talgard, back to you. Um, I have some questions. He has some questions about super juice. Uh, first off, what is your opinion of super juice? What's your opinion of super juice, John? Like, like drinking pomegranate juice with blueberries in it? Like that kind of super juice? No, no, that's super foods. Oh, so what's super juice? Ah, well, we'll get in. Super okay. juice, super juice, what they do is, is they, they take, they take like peel and they make an oleo. Right. Oh. Then they add some juice and then a bunch of acid and then well, it's water. not oleosaccharum. They make an oleo directly with acid powders, not sugar. Well, it's all the same. It doesn't matter to me. Like in other words, th- that's a mechanical thing. But in other words, there, there's sugar. No, there's not sugar. Right. There's there's acid, and then there's water and juice and peel. Acid, water, juice and peel. Acid, water, juice and peel, juice and peel. Right. So uh, that's what. Uh, 
you know, that's what's in it. So, uh, Quinn, good clarification because, right, you're not crushing it with sugar. You're crushing it with acid. By the way, everyone thinks that sugar is magic. It's literally a mechanical operation. When you're making an oleosaccharum, you're smashing a granular thing into peel to break the peel and release the oil, which then gets wicked into the granular item. It's not some magic property that sugar has per se or that acid has per se. Uh, okay, so let's finish the, the question here. What, well, first off, what's my opinion of super juice? Here's my opinion. Um, to the extent that you are stretching juice, I don't – look, I'm not trying to yuck anyone's yum. I'm just saying that in a shaken cocktail – Water plus acid provides no texture. In order to have texture in a shaking cocktail, you need actual juice. So to the extent that there is less juice in super juice, it is going to provide less of a good texture in a shaking cocktail. That's less and less important the worse you are at shaking cocktails or the longer you're going to wait to drink a shaking cocktail after it's made. But for – you could also add a bodying agent to it, right? You could add some you know, proteins or whatever to it and make it froth as well as a normal – citrus does but so that that's one thing two there's the claim that super juice lasts longer well to the extent that it has less juice in it to go bad then it lasts longer because there's less of that poison detergent taste that you get from old juice when the majority of the acid is actually just from acid so there's that lastly the peel covers up some of those uh kind of old juice which is why oleo whether it's made with sugar or whether it's made with uh, – no, it's not saccharum. Oleo as, as, acidum. What do you think? Oleo acidum with a quinine? Uh, they call it ole, oleo citrate. Why? You don't have to use – it's not citric a citrate. Acid. Citric acid. They're not oh, using yeah. sodium citrate. That's a terrible name. Whoever's calling it that, stop. Because you can use other acids and the actual component of the acid is completely unimportant. Please stop calling it citrate. You're going to cause another problem where, like, you know, Ferran's people called mono and diglycerides gliss, and then everyone thought glycerin and mono and diglycerides were the same thing, which they are not. So don't name things the things that are patently incorrect. You know what I'm saying, Quinn? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, acid. yeah, acid. Yeah. Oleo acid. There you go. Anyway, so, uh, the peel notes also cover up the detergent notes of over-the-hill fresh lime juice, okay? So all of those things make something that's going to last longer. If you like it better, if you actually like the taste of it better, then as they say in the trade, God bless, right? But I don't uh, – you know, I think that you could build a drink where that drink wants to be made with that as opposed to with regular juice, um, you know – uh, it's not what I use. Is this? Be, am I being fair? Yeah, yeah. Quinn, I, I've made some pretty good ones. But w- good for what? I made a pollen lemon acid that was pretty yummy. But why not just and use lemon made, juice and pollen? I don't, what kind of pollen? Fennel pollen? Uh, well, I, I think uh, bee pollen, like regular yeah. bee pollen. Why not just add pollen to? Why not add bee pollen to lemon juice? Well, I think, one, you get an actual, I mean, you know, with the super juice, I would say it's really just a different product because with a citrus juice, you're getting the acidity, you're getting the flavor of the juice, but you're not really getting the flavor of the peel. With the super yeah, juice, but, but you, but you're really getting that, like... My problem isn't the flavor the of the peel, and by the way, it's called... Squeeze a peel into that thing. That's what we call that in, you know, we, we do that all the time. We make a drink, we go Sheboygan, and we put oil on the top of the drink, and there you go. Peel. You know what I mean? But you, you, could, you don't have to use water and acid to do it. You could use a neutral powder. Yeah, I know. You could do anything. Yeah, I'm saying it's, it's, I mean, getting the it's flavor like, of the peel yeah, in is one there. thing. My main problem isn't that somebody wants peel in their drink. You know, people who like limoncello, they, they're sucking on peels. You know what I mean? Like, they are peel suckers. But, like, uh, you know, I'm saying that my issue with it is the, that you're lowering the amount of juice that's being used in it. I don't necessarily think for a 
valid reason other than cost savings. And I, my guess is that the product would be better if it had more juice. And the idea that it lasts longer to me means that there's less juice in it. I, but I'm not saying it's bad. If I want lemon juice, I could take pollen, add it to lemon juice. I could get peel flavor into that without having to do an acid adjust on it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I guess. It just, it's very, you know, convenient to make a batch of that. And then you have a very highly flavorful acid. I mean, for cooking or for cocktails? For cocktails. Okay. Well, I mean, like, a lot of times when you do things, what I don't like is, here's, a, here's the other thing. What I don't want is, are you familiar with the law of incremental crappiness? Uh, no, but I can deduce. Yeah. So what happens is, is you're like, oh, here's the drink, like I make it. Now I'm going to do something that's slightly crappier, right? And by that I mean I'm cutting a corner. And I can't tell the difference between A and B. So now I start doing B. Now I have B. And I think it's as good as A. And then I make that slightly crappier. And now I have C, which I can't tell the difference between B and C. Then I have C, and then I make it slightly crappier, and on down the line. And by the time you get to, like, G, if you ever go back and make A, you're like, oh, right, 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 yes, right. And so, like, things that are incrementally more crappy from a cost-cutting standpoint, if you're doing it because you think it tastes better, then please do it. If you're doing it to cut a corner, and that's fine as long as you're aware of incremental crappiness because that's how sour right, mix is, happened, right? That's how like bars is, ended up using sour mix. Is reduce, but also it's also supposed to be to reduce waste. Yeah, but what are you wasting? Well, the rest of the lemon, I guess. All I'm saying, you can use the peels. I use peels. You can make bitters with them. You can do yeah, a bunch can, of things. Yeah, but yeah, but again. Can every bar always use all of their juice and all of their peel? I mean, my bar definitely can't use that much super juice because I'm not shaking a cocktail with that thing. You know what I mean? Like, I want fresh tasting, fresh, 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 fresh. If I want peel, I want peel. I used to save up the whole things and make bitters with them. But, you know, I, the amount of money people spend on a cocktail is unconscionable. So the idea that I'm going to save incremental money off of the lemon juice and give someone a product that I think is not inherently superior to me seems unethical. That's me, though. I think some people think, I think people do think it's superior or equivalent. If they think it's superior, like I say, if you think it's superior, if you've actually had a side-by-side -side drink shaken and you're like, I would take this one every day, then do it. But... If you make a super juice with peel and then a, uh, an actual juice and add peel to it, if peel is what you want, I'm pretty sure you're going to find the actual juice is better. That's all. And also, I, you know, a lot of them are kind of like all over the map with the amount of acid they're using. And so I don't actually know what the acidity is. So what they could be saying is they actually want less liquid in. There's all sorts of problems with it. Um, but again, I'm old. I don't want to yuck anyone's yum either. You know what I mean? But uh, – do side by side taste tests, and if you actually think, do a triangle test. If you actually think it's better, great. But you know there are ways to do things that aren't about saving money when you're charging someone a lot. At home, do whatever you like. I'm saying professionally, if you are giving someone a less expensive product because it's less expensive, rather than because it is better, and you are charging them the same amount. I have an issue. That's all. I don't want to rip people off. Neither do I wish to be ripped off. That's all. Uh, you know, it's like people used to get mad about meat glue because they, they thought that what, you know, you were going to do is just take a bunch of scraps of garbage meat and glue them together into a steak and then serve it like, you know, like an expensive steak. That's unethical. That's not what most people did who used meat glue. But that was the fear of meat glue. And, you know, I think they were right to fear that because to me that's unethical. You know, it turns out it doesn't work because it looks like a freaking quilt. Like when you glue a bunch of stuff together and you send it to someone, it looks like you're sending them a quilt. They're like, this is not a steak. You, you think I don't know what a steak looks like? They think I don't know what a steak looks like. Jerks. Anyway. Um, all right. So what's my feelings? I feel we've covered and smothered that. 
Uh, from all I've been able to find online, it should not really be possible to extract oils with acid to begin with. Even more so, if you did, this should not really be soluble in water. It would be an emulsion or a suspension. Uh, in the case of emulsion, we would need an emulsifier. Uh, is that just present in the peels to begin with? Uh, if it's a suspension, it would have separation issues. Yeah, no, it's not. You're, you're not dissolving the oil. You're just kind of pulverizing and getting it. My guess is that it's like a... It's kind of like a suspension or it's, it's – I don't I haven't like analyzed it at all, but I bet you there's some creaming or separation over time. There's really not that much oil. I mean, there's some, right? There's also a lot of wa- water-soluble things in the peel as well that come out. But oil – when you squeeze a peel, oil that comes out does indeed float on the top of your drink. You can see it. You can see it. You can see it come out and you can see it form a layer on the top of the drink. Um, Bonus question. While making super juice at my current bar, I was told that we had to be careful to keep the lid on the malic acid because it's bad to breathe in the gases. My immediate reaction was, what do you mean? It is not volatile. However, I found that it does kind of burn the nose to smell the top of the canister, even more so uh, once it's, uh, mi- when it's mixed in with the lime peels. What's going on there? Dust, my friend. Dust. Uh, my mom always used to get mad at me because I would open containers of tang and put a spoon in it, and I put my face over it because I like to breathe in the tang smoke, you know. Like, uh, and uh, my mom was like, "That fine powder is not good for your lungs," and so it's really just an aerosolized powder is what's going on there. It is not volatile, but malic acid. More so, the malic acid that you buy a lot of times is a finer powder than the citric acid is, and so you probably get more malic acid smoke than you do get citric uh, acid smoke. You can get larger crystals of either, by the way, Um, and I would guess that the larger the crystal is, the better it is in oleo land because then it's more of a little grain of sand eating into the peel, which is really what's happening when you're you're making those oleo XYZs. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um... That cover and smother that guy? Yeah, I'd say so. All right. Uh, From Delicious Pear. Uh, Does anyone have – by the way, pears are delicious. Nastasia, remember that pear trip we took? Yeah, I do, fondly. Yeah, that's good. And we – unlike the second time I went when that guy stopped us from eating everything, jerk. That pear liquor we had at uh, Skernick? Oh, my God. What's that guy's name again? It it, it went out of my head, but that guy's pear – it – I don't know what it is, right? But there are certain pair ODVs where when you taste them, do you know how like uh, like some pears have a, a granularity to the flesh? Like they're yielding but granular. I swear to God, some of these ODVs, you can taste that granularity in your mouth and I have no idea why. You're like you eat it and there's the sensation that you have that texture in your mouth. I don't get it. I asked the guy, and he was like, I don't care. Shut up. But You know what I mean? Pretty much. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was like, but why should I shut up? This is a miracle. Why, why, are, why, are, why are more people not talking about this? Yeah. Uh, does anyone have experience uh, making floral infusions slash syrups? Syrups. I live near several groves of wild plums. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, we missed yeah, the season. Yeah, we missed the season. Um, the blossoms of which I'd like to turn into a syrup or cordial. I see that some recipes call for steeping the flowers first in just hot water, then adding the sugar over a, a bain marie. You can say that with a fancy accent. Bain marie. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, other recipes call for making the simple syrup first and then adding the flowers to infuse. Would you expect a discernible difference between these techniques or are they mostly interchangeable? Yes. The answer is yes. Any infusion, how you do the technique is going to radically change what's going on because – uh, likewise, are there other methods for extracting flavor and aroma alcohol that would be worth a shot? Thanks in advance for the feedback. Listen, every infusion technique is different. It's like Rosemary's Baby. Every every pregnancy is different. You have to be like if, oh, an old movie. A lot of people haven't seen Rosemary's Baby. So like the devil that basically uh, – who's, who's that? Is that Mia Farrow? Is, yeah, it's Mia Farrow is having a baby with the devil, but she doesn't know it. And they're in this fancy New York apartment in the Dakotas, which is where John Lennon used to live. And, and also Peter Tosh. Bad luck for musicians to live in the Dakotas, as it turns out. Real bad luck. Uh, but um, anyway, so the apartment next door is where the devil worshippers get to go. And so she doesn't know that she's pregnant with uh, Satan's baby. And the OB, her OBGYN, right? She's like, I don't feel right. This doesn't feel like it should feel because it's Satan is growing inside of her. The Antichrist is growing inside of her. And so it turns out that your body doesn't respond well to harboring the Antichrist in your womb. And what the doctor says is, and I use this all the time, every pregnancy is different. And then just walks out. 
And she's like, okay. I mean, it was like a long time ago, so people were expected to listen to what their doctors said. Anyway, uh, same, tangent uh, Tuesday. Same thing with uh, same thing with infusions. Every infusion is different. So the actual uh, what I would do is this: there are there are different things you should test. A pure alcohol infusion, i.e., like ninety five percent, is going to pull out. Uh, there are some things that are very non water. There, sorry, that are very water soluble. That are not very alcohol soluble. There are things that are alcohol soluble that aren't very water soluble. Right. Then if you pull glycerin, which is another infusion thing that you can use. Right. There are things that are uh, less soluble in glycerin and more soluble in glycerin. So you can up or lower the different uh, items that you're pulling out of anything, flowers included, depending on the actual solvent you're using. And every flower is also different and you're extracting different things from them. So certain flowers like tuberose, for instance, are very difficult to do with heat infusions because the heat goes away. So when I wanted the aroma of tuberose, which is like, you know, one of the classic lay flowers, we would order, remember Stas, we would order those lays from Hawaii and they would like overnight ship us lays from Hawaii and then we would throw them directly into the rotovap. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was good. Expensive, but good. This is something you want to do with culinary school money and not with your own money. Uh, So we would do distillations of those because it's very difficult. In fact, usually things like that are done with enfleurage, which is like a zero heat thing. And the kind of more astringent and nasty things in the tube rows aren't going to get pulled out by the fat. And then when you remove the rows and then put the alcohol on the fat, only the good stuff comes off, right? So – it's a game in a flower to only take those things that you want and to not take those things that you don't want. I read up on plum flowers, though, and it looks like they're pretty robust, and you can just make a regular simple syrup with them. But uh, uh, flowers in general are all different. So I used to do – it's linden flower season right now. Lindens have just started blooming here. They make a great uh, drink. Next year, I just read honey locust flowers aren't poisonous. I'm going to do honey locust flowers. So I would recommend – Looking and seeing what other people do. If sugar works, um, use it. And if the aromas are heat stable, some things taste better once they've been heated a little bit. Uh, and some things taste much, much worse and some things taste different. So I'm not giving you any actual advice. I'm just saying I would try a very high proof. I would try a uh, alcohol. If you don't want alcohol, I mean like I try to keep things kind of cool because typically things like that are changed in a direction I don't like when they're heated. But whatever. Did I answer this question? Yeah. All right. They could also try a really small batch of like a really simple water distillation hydrosol. I mean, there's very simple uh, if they guides have a for like still. Make, well, no, the, the, there's very simple guides for making rose water where you have like a nested, a nested bowl in a pot and then an inverted lid with ice. Yeah, I've seen that kind of distillation. I have never had a hydrosol that I thought was worth spit. I'm saying is that if you've never done a distillation before, I'm sure you can get a hydrosol that's good. But if you've actually had like a rotovap and done like hardcore distillation, when you taste them side by side, it makes you never want to do that other stuff ever again. Maybe rose water might be different because it's extremely delicious. Extremely, uh, sorry, um, not delicious, uh, traditional, right? So there might, it might be, you know, fine. It might be fine. Um, The thing about, I'll say about hydrosols is, is that a lot of the aromas are extremely fugitive when they're in water. And so uh, what we used to do is uh, when we had to do water-based distillations at Booker and Dax because we were following the letter of the law on distillations in our rotavap, we would – as soon as something was distilled, it would be distilled into high-proof liquor. And that way you're fixing it down. If you don't want to use alcohol, glycerin would be another way to fix those fugitive aromas into a product because hydrosols just don't hold on to their aroma very well. They just don't. That's, you know, uh, and they don't necessarily uh, extract well uh, you know, all the time. That's why you, know, you don't have just water-based vanillas. You have glycerin-based vanillas and you have alcohol-based vanillas. And, and I think making your own vanilla extract is, is a foolishness anyway. Listen, if you – anything that says that you're – have you ever – I've been to a flavor house, right? David Michael, and they are one of the – one of their specialities is vanilla, right? And so they showed me a giant vat. I went with the museum. Stas, did you go with us that time? Peter Kim, did you go with us? Yes, I was there with you. Yeah, yeah. 
I can't remember. I can't remember where everyone is. But so like there's a giant vat of vanilla seeds, like 55 gallon drums full of vanilla seeds. Right. And chopped up the, the, the you know, the outside of the husk. And there and uh, Julie Snarsky, who was our host, was like, taste it. We're like, what? She gives us a plastic spoon. She goes into this thing, gives us a big scoop of vanilla seeds. Taste it. So I tasted it. You know what it tasted like? Not vanilla. Like nothing. Like nothing. So like those folks. But tell them what you did with them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So Julie was saying that she's like some people. She doesn't talk like that. She's like some people. They only like vanilla ice cream if it's got the dots. So we take all of these flavorless dots that are worthless and we sell them to people to stir back into vanilla ice cream to make people think that someone has scraped a vanilla pod into the ice cream. So anytime, oh, Stas, such a good call to bring that yeah, story like up. Yeah, Haagen-Dazs. What? Didn't she say like Haagen-Dazs? Oh, Yeah. Hagen dazs Briars, all of them. Briars, yeah, of them. Yeah. There is no such thing as <laughs> someone sits there with a knife, splitting open a vanilla pod and going, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, scraping it down and adding that crap because that's leaving vanilla on the table. The pod that you're throwing away has flavor. It is sapid, as we say in the trade. So they extract all the flavor and then sell worthless vanilla dots back to people. <laughs> That they can stir into their ice cream to make us all think that somehow someone's been sitting there with a with a with you know their petty knife scraping scraping vanilla pods all day, which is not how it works. So, if you think you're going to make a vanilla extract as good as the professionals, a good luck, because you ain't. You also don't have the sourcing. You just don't have the sourcing. Uh, all right. Uh, Monty Zukowski wants to hear Quinn's review of the creamy. But here's the thing. Oh. What's your review? I mean, like, how how would you frame the review of the creamy? What I would say is maybe let's put a pin in that till next week because we are recording at a different time. Yeah. And then maybe we'll have a, maybe we'll have a lack of questions. All right. So we could circle back. To that review. So if you love it, put a pin in it. Remember that song? If you love it, put a pin in it. Remember that? It's a good song. No, you put a ring on it. Oh, uh, same thing. Uh, <laughs> Christian Sacco writes in, Quinn mentioned getting Macienda products in Vancouver. I tried to get some not long ago, but they don't ship to Canada. Does Quinn have a special connection, some sort of special mojo? Or does he know a Canadian distributor or a way to get Macienda? Are you one of those freight forward people? Are you a freight forward person? Yeah, yeah, no. The secret, uh, Christian, is... Paying through the nose for a yeah. mail forwarder. <laughs> yeah. How much? Okay, so just so people know, how much does a mail forwarder cost? Like, like, uh, how does it work? I mean, you, you pay a small amount to like join. You pay a small oh. amount for every package, and then you just gotta pay whatever the shipping is. But it in other words, like, it is. Is, is it like the? Is it cost as much to ship from the forwarder as it does to ship from? The original person? Like, in other words, are you, like, basically, tripling the shipping price or what? They're basically doubling it, at least. Okay. All right. But it's a way to get Although, things. In, in, in your soul, you can feel better whenever the primary shipper or the primary uh, merchant offers free domestic shipping. Okay. So you're, you're only paying and once. you're like, oh. Yeah. And then well, you just have to sign up with a fake you're account. Pay, yeah. You're paying for both. You're yeah. paying for both because... Right, you only see you know, the one. The cost of shipping. Right, you only see the yeah. one. Yeah, all right. Uh, from it Brian... Feels better. What? What would you say? It feels better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's all about feeling. You know what I mean? So many things are all just about signaling just to yourself. Not all signaling is to the outside world, Quinn. Some of it's just to yourself. Um, Bryce writes saying, Question... Uh, and I, I apologize, uh, Bryce. I did not read the uh, article that you uh, linked to because I am a low quality individual. Uh, Kenji has a Neapolitan pizza dough recipe that starts with an eight to twelve hour room temperature rise. Would there be any damage if I forget about it and don't ball it up uh, and don't ball it up and refrigerate it until the sixteen or eighteen hour mark? No. Uh, would there be any flavor or texture degradation? No. Um, and then. Um, a link to the thing. Here's the thing. 
you know, bread is – look, there are a billion ways to, slight, to, to, make, to do bread. There is no such thing as the right answer with uh, bread. There really isn't. Um, there really isn't. There really is not. Like everyone is all hyped up. Oh, the best, but, but like especially on uh, – and I know like look, I get in – my brother Wiley, my brother-in-law Wiley, right? He's got stretch and people get all bent about being hyper specific. And when you're doing it every day, you need to be incredibly on point. You need – it's a real game of golf or bowl. Pick your repetitive needs to do the same way every time. Because it needs to be the same all the time. It needs to act the way the same way all the time. But the difference between uh, letting it rise for an extra four hours off of a 12-hour thing, uh, if it overrises and falls, it's going to rise again anyway uh, when you do it. And really what you're worried about is dough exhaustion. And I don't think that you're going to exhaust the dough because of that extra section of rise. And if you were really, really worried about it, Right. Uh, Using a refrigerator to refrigerate dough, right, is incredibly imprecise. It takes a long time for the center of a ball of dough to go from room temp from ferment temperature down to refrigeration temperature. So really, you should be specifying in any recipe the thickness of the dough ball and how you're getting heat transferred to it. So I was talking to Wiley about how he does his uh, his dough retardation in the free. And so, like, he has a, a very specific stacking pattern. So, like, the things are in the same thing. They're open to the air of the fridge for a certain length of time. The humidity is kept where it is so that he can have a repeatable cool down period. So unless you're doing that, I think a couple hours plus or minus on your initial rise ain't going to make a, a, any difference. What do you think, uh, John? Yeah. All right. Fuck Jack, here's a math question. I'm building a chocolate tempering setup by cutting a hole in the lid of a polycarbonate bin and putting a hotel pan in that hole and then filling the bin with water and using a Nova circulator to heat the water in the pan. I'd like to get two pans going so I can do two chocolate types at once, which means a bigger pan. How much cubic water can I heat with one Nova circulator or with two? I forget exactly what number of liters, but it's uh, I wouldn't go much above like uh, 24, 24 liters of water all day. That should be fine. You also like obviously don't want to get water in the chocolate, so be extremely careful about uh, spillage. You can build like a uh, a jacket that like pumps inside of the jacket so that nothing gets up. But it's a little more it's a little more difficult. Uh, in reality, especially the lower the temperature, which chocolate is very low temperature, the more water you can do. So that twenty something liters is to heat up hot. I I have done whole Lexans, whole full size. How big is a Lexan, John? You remember the dimensions? I don't, but you know the full food yeah. box Lexans. You can get one it's of those big. well up, easily up to temp, uh, temp, chocolate temperature thing. The issue is is that the more liquid you have and the less insulated it is, the more drift you get. So you're going to get one or two degrees over. The less water you have, the more precise you can be, and the less drift you're going to have. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. Ken Ingber wants to know, does mixing vermouth with 80 proof plus spirits extend the shelf life of vermouth by itself? Or is it only mostly oxidation that is the problem? And does pre-mixing do much for that? Um, it, it will extend the life somewhat. Uh, people used to store, uh, you know, Manhattans, not diluted Manhattans. Once it's diluted, it's not protected anymore. But I would guess you would get uh, some extension in shelf life. But it does change over time. That's why people used to age uh, bottled but undiluted cocktails to get the change. And I can get to the rest of your uh, – oh, Ken, I'm going to come back to you on our next No Tangent uh, whenever we're recording it. Next time we record next week on – I'm in Rochester next week, people. That's why I will not be here. I'll be at the Rochester Cocktail uh, oh, Classic. Nice. Yeah, Rochestering it up. Eating hot dogs. Cooking issues. 